hi there everyone thank you so much for taking the time to join us here this afternoon we have got a great session planned for you i promise but before we kick off i'm delighted to hand you over to glenda to welcome you properly Thank you, David. Um, good afternoon, Ulster University students, Ulster colleagues and friends. My name is Glenda Martin from the Ulster Employability and Careers team, and I would like to welcome you to our final Future Skills Week session, Unlock Your Future with David Mead. We are delighted to have David with us this afternoon to close our Future Skills Week event. And many of you will know that David is a, a well-known cornerstone international speaker but more importantly today, he is also one of us, an Ulster graduate. So for over 15 years, David has been inspiring people and, and virtual audiences across the world. So today in a fun and high energy session, you will be inspired to, to think critically about life challenges. And you'll also take away a practical toolkit that you can use immediately, regardless of where you are on your career journey. So all I will say is pick the cat out, mute the phone and settle yourself in a front row seat and be prepared for anything. David, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. And I will now pass over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn. And I really am excited to join you. I, uh, It is true, I'm a graduate of University of Ulster. I know they're calling it Ulster University these days. I like to consider myself pretty old school, so it'll always be University of Ulster to me. And honestly, it uh, the time that I spent there changed the direction of my life. It changed the way that I look at my job and my career and the business that I have today. And in this session, I will give you some practical, actionable tools and techniques that you'll be able to apply and employ straight away. Now, if you wanna get the best out of this session, I genuinely believe just because we are socially distanced doesn't mean we need to be socially isolated. So I want all of you to do me a favor, turn your camera on now, come on. We've been in a pandemic for about 14, 15 months now. You know how to work your camera, dry your eyes. I'd like to see as many of your faces as possible and it will be interactive. So do be ready to unmute here and there from time to time so that I've got the opportunity to look how excited your wee faces are now that you've got the cameras on. Look at everybody, give yourselves a wave. Hello, hello. Angie Johnson looks like she's on the news. Ailish Spence, good tasting glasses. Ailish, you're like my sister from another mister. And we've got lots of people um, in the chat as well. Norman Hagen. Wow, Norman, I haven't seen the name Norman in ages. Who looks at a wee baby and goes, let's call this one Norman. I haven't seen a name of Norman in ages. We got Aoife Carlin, Amy Stevenson, Laura Cranston, people coming from all over the place. So thank you so much for investing a little bit of time in yourself and in your future as well. Now, I know many of you won't have seen me speak before. Loads of loads more of you are putting your camera on now because they're all going, I'd really quite like to see myself now on the screen. There you are, there you are. You're still there, you're still there. Don't worry, we'll get you back up in a wee while. If you haven't seen me speak before, only fair that I should give you an introduction to me. My name is David Mead and my primary career was always as a university lecturer. And I did that up in McGee. If you haven't studied in McGee, you are missing out. This is like the Las Vegas of Northern Ireland. I loved every second of not only studying there, but lecturing as well. And I was fascinated by the characteristics of high performing teams, organizations and individuals. What are the small changes that they can make and take every day to help move the needle on their performance. Things like decision making. What is it that makes a great decision? One that you can stand by not only at the point at which you make it, but across the entire life of that decision. They are the oxygen of great organizations. And if we're not making and taking them all the time, we're already starting to slow down. That's what leads to that CC mentality, because in times of change, decisions slow down. Decisions about your career, decisions about your next step after studying, decisions about that big ambition that you've been putting off for the longest period of time. And for me, motivation and engagement is a huge huge one. Think about it. Inside your class or inside your last Zoom room, you can have two students who are on the same program, studying the same topics in the same industry, the same sector or space, but for some reason performing dramatically differently. And it's the same out in the working world as well. Two employees working on the same desk, 
on the same pay scale, looking out the same window, but for some reason performing dramatically differently. What is it that separates them? Persuasion is a big part of my work. I teach organizations the real science of how to hear the word yes. Whether you're selling something, talking about your products or services, change mindset and resilience will be a big part of this talk today. I will show you how to adjust the way that you think so you can massively, positively impact the results that you get. But language interpretation which I have already started inside the zoom room and I can tell you I will diagnose all manner of fairly psychotic tendencies there's quite a few of you there I don't want to point out anybody in particular but I mean you can see the dangerous one uh, and goals and planning did you know that some goals, just by the way that we write them down and communicate them inside or outside of our teams, are dramatically more or less likely to be achieved just because of the words that we use. Now, I call these soft skills or mindful business skills. The reason I do is it doesn't matter what your role is. It doesn't matter what program you are on now today. You're going to leave this session with something that you can use. And it's a really short session. I only have you here until about 9.30 p.m. So strap yourselves in. The Zoom doors are locked. You're not going anywhere. But if we are going to spend a bit of time together, only fair that I should get you a little bit warmed up. I think for me in this session, I want to encourage you to think about the decisions that you make every day. The decisions that affect your career, that affect your next step, that affect whether or not you might make and take that next big opportunity, whether that is starting your own business or going and working in an industry that is entirely unrelated from where you are now. I think one thing that characterizes my job, my career and my business is the fact that I had no idea that I'd be sitting doing what I'm doing right now. And while I was at uni and while I was studying, I had jo every job under the sun from working at a dating agency, cleaning toilets in a hotel in Newry, working as a waiter in Washington, D.C. And I have to tell you, I was useless. It is difficult to articulate how bad I was as a waiter. But from all of these little jobs from all of these things I learned something that helped me do my job that I'm doing today and I think it's that flexibility and that agility that we'll all be able to take something away from so let's get you all warmed up first give yourselves a wave everybody give yourselves a wave look at this how exciting Gail Hamilton's delighted she's tidied the room behind her Carrie Jossart was a little hesitant on the wave there Carrie but it's a good wave now that we're there go all right settle down Carrie if we could call Carrie's care worker please all right my job's gonna be to get you all warmed up I need you to follow my instructions, everybody. Take both hands. By the way, Donna, that is a hell of a clock up there. Look at the size of Donna's clock. Are you joking me? Look at this. Wow, did that come with the caravan, Donna, or did you put it in? That is some clock. All right, everybody, follow my instructions. I want you to take both hands, put them straight out in front of you like this, straight out in front of you. I want you to shake both your hands for me, please. Matty on the bottom row struggling to balance the laptop down there. Don't worry, Matty. Don't damage it. Shake out your hands for me. If you've never been, this is what Ibiza was like in the mid-1990s. I want you to turn your hands so your thumbs are pointing down for me, please. Then take your left hand, put it on top of right, and interlock your fingers. Now, there are a couple of rules to this. The rules are don't unlock your fingers, don't bend your elbows, and don't let your arms drip or droop. Laura Cranston, are you not doing this? You're not invisible, Laura. I can see. Okay, hands higher, Laura. I said you're going to cheat. Uh, so without unlocking your fingers, without bending your elbows, do what I do. I want you to turn your hands so your thumbs are pointing up. Nobody know. It's this until home time. It's this until... Letty Ann in the top is going to dislocate her shoulder just to try and make that work. I can tell it's really annoying. All right, we're going to do the same thing again. By the way, Brendan Tumblety, if you don't know how to do this by now, I, I, I really think you should take a look at yourself. Let's shake out your hands again for me. Shake out your hands. This time, I want you to take your left hand, put it behind your back for me, right hand straight out in front of you, and do everything that I say. Make a circle with your thumb and index finger and place that circle against your chin for me. That's not your chin, that's not your chin. Look at Nicole McBride was like slowly sneaking it down there as if you got it right. It looked like you were having a stroke for a second, Nicole. Okay, next one. This time I want you to extend your right foot perfectly straight out in front of you. And you can take that off your cheek, by the way. Matty would have been there for about 12 weeks. Extend your right foot straight out in front of you and spin it in a clockwise circle. Now spin it, spin it, spin it. Don't stop spinning it. While you're spinning it, take your right hand in the air and make a figure of eight. 
Now you look at your fit. Doesn't know what it's doing, does it? No? All right. Well, a good job, all of you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well done, well done. Well done for trying out. Not bad, not bad. Donna McGean's properly warmed up now. She's exhausted. God love her. Okay, well, I want to test. I think one of my big themes for this session is how we embrace change, how we're not afraid to be flexible, not afraid to make brave decisions and spot when things are changing around us and maybe changing our behavior to respond to that as well. So I want to try a really simple test. If you've ever seen any of my TV shows before, uh, then you'll know that I'm fascinated by uh, how, how the, the brain perceives amazing and incredible things, especially psychologically. So in a moment, I'm going to perform a trick for you. Now, it's a recorded trick, but in an unusual break from convention, I'm going to tell you exactly how the trick works before I do it. I know, shut the front door. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to show you a card trick. And the way that it's done is I'm going to switch the deck. Your job is to watch really carefully and see if you can spot when I switch the deck. Now, I want you to open up the chat module. As soon as you think that I've done it, type the word deck into the chat and let's see who gets closest. And we'll start right away. I'd like to perform the incredible color changing card trick using a blue back deck of cards. The premise is simple. Claire, you can choose any card that you like. Okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this one. Now, I want to be absolutely clear here that this is fair. This is a real deck of cards in a random order. There's no way anybody could know in advance what card Claire might pick. So let's take a look at her random selection. Okay, let's see. The Three of Clubs. Now, the Three of Clubs goes right into the middle of the deck, and this is where the magic happens. I'm going to spread the cards out across the table, and when I give a magical click, you can see that the Three of Clubs now has a blue back. Not terribly magical, I hear you say, until we look at the rest of the cards and realize every single one of those now has a red back, and that is the incredible color-changing card trick. All right, so tell me, did you spot the switch? Let's take a little look inside the chat. So Rachel OK has got it. Rachel OK. If that's your last name, it's the greatest last name I've ever heard. Uh, Tara Graham has spotted it. Carrie Jossart, very fancy last name. Carrie Jossart, you should design your own curtains. They sound like they'd be expensive. Um, let's see. Uh, Letty Ann said you did it when you were looking at the three of clubs. Letty Ann, you're being very aggressive. All right, so calm down. No need to shout in the chat, Letty Ann. All right, if we need to, we can call security. Kristen uh, spotted it, S uh, Sarah Banye spotted it. Okay, so really interesting. Quite a lot of you spotted it. Of course, it did get swapped at one point, but the truth is when we are navigating change, when we're dealing with uncertainty, sometimes we miss an awful lot more than we're focusing on. So why not take a second look? I'd like to perform the incredible color changing card trick using a blue back deck of cards. The premise is simple. Claire, you can choose any card that you like. Okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this one. Now, I want to be absolutely clear here that this is fair. This is a real deck of cards in a random order. There's no way anybody could know in advance what card Claire might pick. So let's take a look at her random selection. Let's see the three of clubs. Now the three of clubs goes right into the middle of the deck and this is where the magic happens. I'm going to spread the cards out across the table and when I give a magical click you can see that the three of clubs now has a blue back. Not terribly magical I hear you say until we look at the rest of the cards and realize every single one of those now has a red back and that is the incredible color changing card trick. So there you, I have to say, my favorite part of that is watching people's reactions on the gallery view. Some of you were angry, some of you were annoyed, some of you were frustrated. Frankly, the moment that I went to take my t-shirt off, Aoife Tasker Lynch, she started screen recording. It was incredibly inappropriate and I'm going to be writing you up to HR. So the fact is, as everything is changing around us, we tend to focus on the thing that in that moment matters to us most. But when we do it, we miss the bigger picture. We miss the opportunities to think about not just what we're doing right now today, whether it's that course, whether it's that assignment, whether it's that thing that we know we need to get done. 
And I think our job is to widen the sphere because in this moment, it's really easy to limit the way that we consider our careers, the way that we consider our job and the opportunities that we're surrounded by. My job is hopefully to help you break out of that a little bit, widen your ambition, think differently about the challenges and opportunities that face you today. So uh, in this session, I'm going to encourage you to consider and, and know the importance of understanding what your strengths are, also to be flexible, to engage in a growth mindset so that you can think, act and behave in fundamentally different ways, how to build your own personal ambition and, of course, to embrace change. Now, when we think about change, I think sometimes everybody convinces themselves that, oh, well, it's hard for me to understand because there is so much uncertainty at the minute what I should be doing next. And every time I think about an impossible challenge like that, I'm always reminded of this guy. Now, many of you won't have heard of him before. His name is Roger Bannister. For years, people tried to achieve the four minute mile. This seemed like an insurmountable, undoable thing. And if you look back in the history books, there were nearly 3000 attempts to complete a mile in under four minutes. And at, the, at that point, in many uh, cases, clinicians and uh, physicians, doctors said that, you know what? Number one, this is impossible. Number two, some said that it was unsafe to even attempt. They thought that maybe the muscle tissue would start to separate away from the bone. One clinical paper suggested that the, the human ankle, the biochemistry of it, may cause it to collapse. They thought that not only was it impossible, but it was unsafe to even try. However, in 1954, Roger Bannister achieved it. This was a sensation. This was one of those rare good news stories that actually got reported. It was on the front page of every newspaper across the world, the top of every radio newsreel. Absolutely everybody talked about it. But in the two years after he achieved it, nearly 300 people had achieved the same thing. Now, what had changed? Nothing had changed. Roads were still the same. Ankles were still the same. Their athletic regimen was still the same. The world was still black and white. Color wasn't invented until the early 90s when Nickelodeon came along. The only thing that shifted was the expectation as to whether or not this thing could or could not be achieved. As human beings, and I know this sounds nauseating, we live up to and down to our expectations of ourselves. If we convince ourselves that the odds are stacked against us, if we convince ourselves that um, that we can, will, might, must, or should, we are much more likely to embrace and successfully take on that challenge. So in this moment, it might be really easy for many of you to say that, oh, well, this is a really odd time to pivot my direction. I'm doing this course, so I should absolutely commit to this as my next step. The truth is, if I had done that, I would never have had the variety of jobs, careers, opportunities that I've had over the course of the last few years. I know that it's important to look out for opportunities, and it is to repivot, to reimagine who you are and what you're doing. But it's also pretty important to not be afraid to craft it, to shape it, to design it. Because even a small change in your direction today, or at least a small change in how open minded minded you are to brand new opportunities can make the most breathtaking difference. And every time I think about the impact of small changes, I want to try a really simple question with all of you. Now, I'm going to ask you on the gallery view, if you were to go to your nearest drawer and take out a blank piece of paper and a pencil on the gallery view, do me a favor, tell me thumbs up or thumbs down how many of you with just a pencil and a piece of paper would be able to recreate this. At, oh, gosh, guys, this is embarrassing. I didn't realize that it was a photograph of me here. I apologize. I, th I thought it was just a random one off Google. What are you laughing at, Carrie? That's offensive. Um, I, I, I didn't realize it was a photograph of me. I'll change it to, to some random person. So if you had a pencil and a piece of paper, could you recreate this image? On the gallery view, give me thumbs up or thumbs down. Thumbs up or thumb. Oh, you've all frozen. Oh, bless. It looks like Angie Johnson's unwell there. Bless you. Don't worry. We'll get you a wee bit of Pro Plus. We'll bring you back in two seconds. So I want you to give me thumbs up or thumbs down. Could you recreate that with pencil and a piece of paper? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, a lot of thumbs down there. It looks like a, it looks like a political party conference. Well, okay. Oh, you might think that you couldn't, and, and I can understand that. Well, the good news is I'm going to teach you exactly how to do it. And it's only going to take me about 15 seconds. But before I teach you how to do it, I need to ask you a different question. If you were armed with just a pencil and a piece of paper, thumbs up or thumbs down, how many of you could do this? Could draw a gray square? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, 
we've got a lot of thumbs up there. Good job. Okay. Well, look, well done. I realize that that gray square is not particularly impressive or particularly exciting. But if you could do one gray square, then you could probably do nine gray squares. That wouldn't take you much longer. And then you could probably do tens of them. You could probably do a few hundred. With a little more time, you could do a few thousand. And then I think it would get to the point where you couldn't reasonably disagree with me. That, oh, yes, it would take a lot of time. But with some effort, with some determination, with some focus and some discipline, that you could genuinely recreate this. And some of you will say, well, hold on, that's not real art, is it? Well, let me introduce you to Chuck Close. Chuck is seriously paralyzed. He's an artist and still wanted to create his work. And of course, um, uh, this is his method. This is his technique. This is what he does. He is one of the top six highest paid living artists in the world today. And what he does is he just takes a photograph of someone and very slowly and diligently breaks it down into squares and he fills them in one square at a time, sometimes with a pencil, sometimes with a thumb or a fingerprint and his work is beautiful and breathtaking and celebrated all across the world because sometimes it's the smallest changes the smallest uh, adaptations that can make the biggest difference so let's think now about what this means in terms of our career because Roger Bannister and Chuck Close they both demonstrated what we refer to as the growth mindset and the truth is as human beings we exist in one of these two spaces at every moment in our life by the way this is easily my favorite part of the talk look what I can do. do it took me about nine minutes to make that work. I'm very impressed with itself. If you could send me a gold star in the post, I'd very much appreciate it. So individuals who have a fixed mindset. And I know some of you will have heard of this before because it is widely documented. In this session, though, I want to talk about the application and about how you can actually use it. Individuals with a fixed mindset believe that their success or failure in any field of life, in any discipline, is predestined. In other words, I'm good at IT, but I'm really bad at public speaking. I'm really good at going to the gym, but I'm very bad at networking and introducing myself to new people. I'm really good at cooking, for instance, but I'm really bad at physical fitness. They believe that their success or failure in any field or discipline is set, is fixed, and cannot really be adapted or changed in any meaningful or measurable way. However, those with a growth mindset believe that it doesn't matter what the discipline is. Um, you can always get 1%, 3%, 5% better at it with just a bit of focus, with a bit of determination. Now, it doesn't matter what that discipline is. You may not necessarily break a four-minute mile or a world record that changes the world, but you can get incrementally better better at it because ultimately all change that we achieve anything that's worth doing is always done in an evolutionary way not in a revolutionary way and there is so much that we could talk around this because the real science behind the growth mindset is extraordinary we know that whichever one of these you institutionalize it actually starts to change the shape of your brain through a principle called neuroplasticity, whichever one of these you make a habit, whichever one of these you institutionalize, it creates little neural pathways that were not there, that did not exist. And the longer you engender, even if you're faking it at the start, the longer you engender a growth or fixed mindset behavior, the more permanent it becomes. So here, I've got a wee challenge for you now. Do me a favor. Everyone, get your mobile phone out for me now. Get your mobile phone. I want you to get it out now. Wave it towards the screen. Wave it towards the screen. Let's see it. Wave your mobile phones. Wave them. Wave them. Look at this. It's uh, it's like we're in Thompson's on a Tuesday night. Uh, okay, I want you to take out your calendar in your mobile phone. And as you take out your calendar, I want you to go to any date in the future for me. It can be seven days from now, seven weeks, seven months, or seven years. I don't mind. And I want you to create a calendar entry called Mindset Check. That's it. Save it. Now, the wonderful thing is you're going to forget that you did this. And in the future, at some point, this is going to pop up on your phone and you're going to see Mindset Check. And you're going to say, oh, yes, I remember that four-eyed balloon from Hollywood told me to put that inside the diary. And it will remind you to be intentional about where your mindset is. Because in my experience, most people think that they're over here on this growth mindset side most of the time. But we oscillate back and forth depending on how our day is going depending on how the weather is depending on whether the vending machine was full at the time that we arrived at it 
And there are incredible practical examples of this. And in a moment, I'm going to tell a story about my own life, about I, how I and my team have tried to live with a growth mindset. We've never, ever talked about it before at, a, at an Ulster University event. So, um, so I'm going to talk about that briefly. But let me give you some other examples from different fields that will inspire you, hopefully, to think a little differently about them. For years, uh, Torval and Dean had worked on their stunning Bolero routine. It was a beautiful piece. It really was over 20 minutes long. They wanted to enter it into the Winter Games, but they realized that the rule says if you want to be eligible to get a medal, your routine has to be four minutes. And at that point, most athletes will have said, ah, well, we can't really do this one, can we? Because it's too long. But they didn't. They decided not to take the fixed mindset. They wanted to live with a growth mindset. They hired a composer to see if they could shrink down the piece of music without losing a sense of what made it the bolero. They got it all the way down to four minutes and about 21 seconds. And at that point, many of them thought, oh, well, you did your best. You tried to shorten it as much as you could, but it's, um, it's still too long. And at that point, most athletes will have taken the fixed mindset approach, but they didn't. They still tried to see if they could make it work because it was such a beautiful piece. They looked into the rules and they realized that the rules said to be eligible to get a medal, your routine has to be four minutes from the moment your blades hit the ice. So what they realized was if they started their routine and choreographed it on their knees, if they did the first 17 to 21 seconds, then it meant that the blades did not touch the ice. They met the criteria to get a medal. That's what they did. And as a consequence, they got a score that has been occasionally matched, but never beaten. It was an amazing moment. People were crying. The judges were throwing flowers and everything. And at this point in my sessions, I used to play the video of this. But a couple of years ago, I was working for the BBC in the United States in Manhattan. I played the video and at the end, a guy came up and he said, uh, hi, my name is Gary. I'm the international head of digital permissions. First of all, that's exactly how he sounded. And second of all, with a name like Gary, of course, that's how he sounded. Anyway, he came up and he said, um, I'm, I don't remember seeing the uh, permission request uh, for you to use that piece of footage. Now, I want to be clear about this. I work for the BBC. I, the footage belongs to the BBC and I was showing it to the BBC. Uh, so I thought he was joking. So I continued to use it. He sent me a cease and desist email a couple of weeks later saying that I'm no longer allowed to use it. Honest to goodness. So I learned three things from that experience. The first thing that I learned is that, you know, if you're going to use videos in your talks, make sure you've got permission for it. That's number one. Number two that I learned, if you don't have permission, make sure the international head of permission is not inside the room. The third thing that I learned is that the BBC are an absolute nightmare. Anyway, example number two, uh, I, I want you all to uh, tell me, give me thumbs up or thumbs down on the gallery view if any of you went to see the World Cup in Russia. Give me thumbs up or thumbs down. Did any of you go thumbs up or thumbs down? Okay, so everyone's thumb is down. Okay, now I, I've been asking this question for about a year now and no one has ever put their thumb up. So either no one went or anybody that did go was not allowed home. But anyway, Russia for years had wanted to host the World Cup. They were really keen to change the way that the destination, that the city, the country was seen. Now, if you know anything about the World Cup, to be eligible to host it, you need to build this monstrous stadium that far exceeds the seating capacity that you would ever need for a national stadium. So you end up with this massive big thing that never gets filled. Now, at that point, most destinations and most cities say, no, we don't want to waste all that money. Let's just let some Someone else have it. That's that's normal part of the course. But they didn't. They took the growth mindset approach. They realized that they've got this stadium that they've had for decades. They realized that if they were to cut the sides off it and build these monstrous semi-permanent grandstands that far exceeded the natural footprint of where the stadium is, they could temporarily add tens of thousands of seats that would give them the capacity that they needed. And in doing so, that would allow them to host the World Cup. They did it, and it was an amazing success story. It was an incredible example of pivoting, of being agile, of being flexible, of taking that growth mindset. It's exactly the same skills that, that I hope all of you will try and work hard to manifest, because they're not hard. You just need to be intelligent intentional about it. Now, what I will say is they knocked down some residential buildings that uh, that permanently meant that people were rehomed, hundreds of people. They closed four local businesses to build these permanent, semi-permanent grandstands, and they closed a road that went the whole way around. 
this was a very Russian approach. This was very Putin-esque when it comes to the growth mindset, but nonetheless, it really did work. And my final example, I'm genuinely fascinated by disability for many different reasons, but I spend so much of my time in the United States, or at least I did before, I don't know if you noticed or not, there's a pandemic, it's teeny tiny, is anybody, you maybe haven't heard there's a pandemic. For me, it's, I think this is one of my top three pandemics. It's definitely, it's up there on, I would give it five stars on Sick Advisor. And uh, I'm fascinated by American politics. And the reason that I am is that it is the best soap opera that you've ever seen. Forget Home and Away and Neighbours. This is what you should be watching. And this guy, Jamie Dupree, is a great journalist because he goes after each side, the Democrats and the Republicans equally. And a couple of years ago, he developed nar laryngitis. It meant that he lost his voice and his team all thought, well, take a couple of weeks off, it'll come back, but it never did. It turns out he had a condition called tongue protrusion dystonia. It meant that the muscle tissue and the muscle tone in his throat just never recovered. So he had no voice. And for him and his entire team, they all took the fixed mindset approach. They all thought, well, we don't have a, if we don't have a voice, then we don't have a show anymore. And for many months, they were all unemployed and out in the job wilderness. And uh, some of his team said, well, Jamie, why don't you write a few blog posts and sure we'll stick them up on the internet. You can't speak them, but nonetheless, it'll still be good to do. He wrote the posts, sent it in, and they never appeared online. He got frustrated and contacted them and said, where did these go? I spent the time to do it. He didn't realize, but two of his team had taken the growth mindset approach secretly and privately. They amassed decades worth of recording of his voice. Every snippet they could find on YouTube, every old tape or reel that existed in his first radio job. They put it all into an Alexa style piece of software. They chopped it up word for word. And they took the blog post that he was writing today, combined it with his voice from yesterday, and today his show is back and the figures are up 11%. The truth is when we are navigating uncertainty, when we're not sure what our next career step or education step is, we often try to avoid it. But I can tell you in my experience, it's the tough stuff. It's the hard decisions. It's the willingness to be brave and say you wanna do something different or be someone different in your next role that helps guide who you are. If I had said no to any of the opportunities or any of the challenges or any of the tests that I've encountered early in my career, I would never be sitting here right now with you. And look at me now, I mean, a year ago, I was flying every single day of the week. The week before lockdown on Monday, I was in Dallas, Tuesday, Philadelphia, Wednesday, Mexico City. I don't recommend it, it had a terrible smell. Thursday, I was in Miami and Friday, I, well, Friday, True story, Friday I was in Hilltown. It was very much the highlight of the week. For those of you who are tuning in from across the world, Hilltown is very much the Knights Bridge of Northern Ireland. It's a very, very high-end place. Um, but ever since, my business has had to navigate and pivot. And uh, so we do this now. I've accidentally become a YouTuber now. How on earth did this happen? And all of my events come from this uh, little studio. And the truth is, there is another challenge facing us just around the corner whenever we start to navigate back towards those in-person uh, events. And that will be another moment for us to run towards that challenge in the same way that Roger Bannister did in the same way that Torval and Dean did. I know many of you in this moment might be avoiding making brave decisions that might um, define what your next step is, but it's the bravery to take those decisions. And it's really easy to say, oh, well, now's not the right time to make a decision about what my next step is. But the truth is you can fix a bad decision. You can't fix indecision. And avoiding the tough stuff is sometimes the worst thing that you can do. Now, I don't know anything about gardening. So forgive me for making a little gardening analogy for a second. If you do know anything about gardening, you'll definitely have seen a butterfly here or there uh, out inside your garden. And over in the uh, bottom left hand corner here, this is how a butterfly cocoon starts. Now, inexperienced gardeners, whenever a butterfly is coming out of the cocoon, it has a little capillary that goes from here from its abdomen. I'm not sure if that's what you call it its chest, I don't think it's, let's stick with abdomen. It goes from there and it goes right inside the cocoon. And it's typically stuck, that capillary is stuck. It's a bit like an umbilical cord. It's usually stuck there for about a week. And if you see the butterfly, it's usually flailing and struggling. And at that point, a lot of people will say, oh, the poor thing's trapped. So they go and give it a little flick to help it fly away. And they'll watch it fly away. They'll feel great because it looks beautiful fluttering away into the sky. 
If you do that, the butterfly will definitely and certainly die within 20, 25 minutes. The truth is that that capillary has to tear, it has to rip. That's what creates the scar tissue that allows that butterfly to live for anything from, um, from a year to, if you've seen any of them in the zoo, they're the size of a dinner plate, they could live for anything from 15 to 17 years. Because it's the tough stuff, it's the brave decisions, it's the willingness to embrace the challenges that sometimes makes us precisely who we are. And those decisions really do matter. So let's try a little experiment around decisions now. I'm gonna get one of you to help me out for a second. This is where everybody says, if I don't look at them in the Zoom room, then I'm absolutely invisible. I'm going to get one of you to help me. It's going to be Maddie. Hello, Maddie. How are you? If you could unmute for me, please. Look at Maddie. Absolutely scundered. Uh, thanks for taking part, Maddie. Hey, where are you today? <laughs> uh, I'm at uh, Bambridge, just outside Jamor in Bambridge. Yep. Bambridge. Uh, I'll meet you in Blend and Bat shortly. Uh, <laughs> Maddie, want to try a really easy experiment. So tell me, what are you studying? What's your discipline? What are you doing? Yeah, so um, I study communication, advertising, and marketing. Um, literally just handed in my last assignment there about two weeks ago. Um, so that's me now. Um, I didn't oh, know fantastic! Uh, <laughs> oh, look, I'm so pleased. You have my uh, you have my warm best wishes. It's a great yeah. industry to be in. It really is. So, so let's see how good you are at making and taking decisions. Uh, so I'm going to try now, Maddie. You won't recognise one of these. This is how uh, your grandparents used to tell the time before we all had tiny wee screens uh, kicking around. You'll notice it doesn't even work. It's held together by sellotape and the glass glass is broken. In a moment, Matty, I'm going to set a time on this watch. Now, Matty, I think that I can. Do you go by Matty, by the way, Matty? Yeah? Yeah, Matty, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've never met a grown-up called Matty. I feel like I'm talking to a seven and a half year old. But don't <laughs> worry, Matty, Matty will stick. So I'm going to set this to a time. I think I can make you say a time, but I need to find out a few things about you first, Matty. Answer these questions honestly and quickly. First of all, I want you to name any room in your house. Go. Bedroom. Tells me a lot about you, Manny. Okay. <laughs> this time, I want you to name any random household object. Off you go. Um, TV. That's that yes, less interesting. This time, name any type of fruit or veg. Quick. Apple. Okay, so um, we've got bedroom, TV, and Apple. So those three questions tell me that in decision-making terms, you're what we would call a conspicuous defector. All right. So um, if anyone has studied psychology, you'll know what that means. That means that he's... um. I mean, kind of a sociopath. Uh, all right, Matty, I have, it's not a massive surprise uh, to HR. I'm gonna, I've set this to a time now. Now, I can't change my mind, Matty, because I'm not gonna touch the little dial that you can see on the right-hand side. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you name a time. Now, you'll name an hour and a minute. And so the hour, of course, can be from one to 12, Matty. Now, don't let me influence you, okay? You should choose an hour for whatever reason. It should feel like a totally three choice, Matty. One and only one hour will feel right to you. But don't be influenced by me. Just choose a number for whatever reason. Matty, what hour would you like? Seven. Seven, okay. Uh, and what about minutes? Now, you can go from one to 59, but Matty, be as specific as you like. What minutes would you like? 37. 37, okay, I'll be honest, that is very specific. People don't always go quite as specifically as that. So 7.37 is, what is that? Is that a lucky time? Is that a special time? Is that the time in the evening you usually started work? Uh, no, no, that's just, just sort of came into my head. I think I think my email address, my uni email address is 37 for some reason. So I just- Oh, excellent. Uh, funny, I, whenever you logged in, his his original name was iHeartBuckFast37. So maybe <laughs> uh, maybe it comes from that as well. Maybe it's a lucky number. All right, so I uh, now 737, would you agree, Matty, if we got this to within like 15, 20 minutes that that would still be impressive and I could definitely still invoice the uni? <laughs> yes, I would agree, yeah. Okay, well, you don't need to worry about that because you got it absolutely spot on. The time on the watch is exactly 7.37. You nailed it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a big round of applause for Matty. Well done, Matty. Good man, Matty. Thank you for taking part. Good job. Actually, let's get a proper round of applause. Let's get the gallery view up. Matty, you can relax and go back. Uh, everybody, big round of applause for Matty. Well done, Matty. Well done. Oh, the gallery. You're frozen again, everybody. It genuinely, I'm not sure why that is. Bless you. We'll bring you back in three, two, one. And let's have a round of applause for Matty. There we go. There we go. He needs it for his delicate ego. What can I say? All right. So now we've talked about how these decisions affect us. And the truth is they really do affect us. And, and our job is to not be afraid to make and take those brave decisions because they really can pay off in extraordinary ways. But we do have to have the self-belief. We do have to believe that these things can, well, might, must, or should have an impact on us. And sometimes we don't always have that self-belief. And I can understand that, especially in these moments of tremendous uncertainty. 
It can be really easy for us to listen to the little voice inside our head that tells us that, no, not you, not now, uh, not at this moment, not yet. But the only time to do anything about anything is right now, today. And I hope that, that you'll agree with me that based on, on some of the stuff that we're just about to cover, is that your mindset and your own personal ambition is yours to author. It's not for someone else to. So I want to show you two really simple little pieces of research that show you the extraordinary power of how you think and act and behave. Because sometimes people think that, oh, well, this whole mindset thing, it's a bit airy-fairy. It's a bit hug a tree, isn't it? I'm not sure it actually affects my results and my performance. Well, we know that it does. Some clever researchers wanted to test and see the power of mindset and self-belief with a really easy experiment. They did it in the field of cardiothoracic surgery. Now, if you know anything about cardiothoracic surgery, you'll know that this is really invasive. It involves cracking your chest open and it, the recovery time is incredibly challenging. So they divided patients into three groups. One group was delivered their pain medication by a doctor looking very doctory. White coat, clipboard, stethoscope, the whole nine yards. The others were delivered exactly the same pain medication, the same morphine, same dosage, same frequency, but they were delivered it through their drip. And of course, there was a control group as well across the three. Now, one thing I should tell you is that actually across these groups, secretly, everyone got their morphine through the drip. The doctor was just giving them a saline solution that was to control for uh, any error or any implement, uh, any application. So I want you to tell me now on the uh, uh, inside the chat, what do you think was the impact of this? Because these are what the results. Um, by the way, lots of love for you inside the chat, uh, Matty. Uh, Sarah is saying, well, uh, and Shauna and Liv and Aideen, a very, very, very impressed. Okay, so I want you to uh, take a look at what the results were. Basically, the group who had the doctor institute deliver, seemingly deliver the morphine, they healed better in every single measurable dimension of their clinical care. They experienced significantly more pain relief. They were discharged earlier. And when they got home, they needed significantly less help and had much less supplementary uh, secondary conditions. Why is this the case? Because they were experiencing, remember, exactly the same clinical care. And you're right, this is very closely linked to the placebo effect because the placebo effect is fundamentally about us believing that something can, will, might, must, or should. And what the same outcomes have been found in many different fields, not just in the clinical and invasive surgery space, but in neurological and psychological conditions. This is the power of us believing that something can happen and that we're the ones that can make it happen. Another amazing uh, piece of research involved housekeepers. They wanted to find out, um, uh, does this actually create a physical difference or does it just change how you think about what you're experiencing? So some clever researchers realized that they needed to find a group of people who didn't consider themselves to be particularly fit, but however, their job actually meant that they were fit. And if you think about it, housekeepers are spending eight to 10 hours a day lifting stuff, putting it down, moving and doing what's pretty close to being a cardio type of workout. So they divided housekeepers into three. They did this over 180 hotels in North America. And in the three groups, here's how it worked. Of course, there was one control group that had no intervention. Group number two had a 15 minute talk before their shift to tell them just about normal, boring health and safety stuff, some compliance training. But the third group was the interesting one. The third group were told that, did you know that the work that you're doing, whether or not you consider yourself to be fit, is the equivalent of going to the gym for three to five hours per week? They were all surprised by this. And across all of the three groups, everyone was assigned a Fitbit. The reason they were assigned a Fitbit was they wanted to check and see after learning that their job is helping their physical fitness. They wanted to make certain that during that, that after that, that they didn't actually do more physical activity. And the results from this were absolutely incredible. The group who were told that the work that you're already doing in just four weeks had lower, a statistically significant lower body fat. They had uh, lower weight and lower blood pressure. Why? Because when we believe something, it physically changes our relationship uh, with the way that we embrace the world. You are in the driving seat of how you feel about the tough stuff and the uncertainty that's happening uh, to you today. Your job is to get in the driving seat instead of sitting in the the passenger seat. Now, I'm conscious that we've only got about seven hours left. So I want to give you just one last little piece of research that genuinely fascinates me. 
researchers wanted to test and see how stress and anxiety might affect our ability to make brave decisions, to do things differently and to embrace challenges. And there is nothing more stressful than karaoke. So what they did was uh, they got people to agree to participate in a study. And when they did, they had no idea that they were going to be forced to sing as part of this. Now, imagine for a second that you were told that whether you liked it or not, because you've agreed to take part in this, you're going to have to sing. OK, so the participants were divided into three groups. Now, of course, there was a control group. They needed to sing in front of strangers and other participants in the study. Control group had no intervention. Their job was just to sing. Group number two, however, were told that over and over again, I need you to repeat the phrase, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious. They only did that for the five minutes before they went on stage. However, group number three, they had exactly the same amount of time, but their job was to repeat over and over again, I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. And the results were absolutely incredible. The experiment was judged by professional singing coaches. They had no idea that a psychological psychological experiment of any kind was taking place. By the way, the song was Don't Stop Believing, which I'm going to have you all unmute at the end of this and we're going to do it together, guys. It's going to be magical. It's going to be like Glee has moved to uh, Belfast. Uh, the, the group who called, told themselves over and over and over again, I'm excited, I'm excited, they massively outperformed both of the other groups. The only thing that changed was that script that they had inside their head. But another fascinating uh, part of this study was looking at the fact that this lasted through time. So, uh, Various versions of the study checked in with them four weeks later and six weeks later and eight weeks later and time and time again the results held true because we live up to and down to our expectations of ourselves. Whether you think you can and I know this sounds nauseating but whether you think you can or whether you think you can't you're right and my final piece of advice truly is I want you to consider who your reference group is. You've all heard that phrase that you are the sum of the three to five people that you spend most of your time with. I implore you to consider how true this is and how powerful this is because uh, I, I really there are many different experiments that we've carried out and that I've talked about in other recent sessions with the Ulster University. But I've got I just recently found a brand new clip that sums this up brilliantly. We are the sum of the people that we spend our time with. So think about who that reference group is. Think about who your your pals, your network and your buddies are, because the impact of them can be huge. And I can prove it with an experiment carried out by candid camera. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently, one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, He looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use... Let's see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Notice they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch.
isn't it absolutely fascinating? The fact is the people around us really do drive our behavior, they drive our ambition and they drive our results. I cannot encourage you enough to think about the reference group. Here, let, let's try. I hadn't intended to show you this, so I'm going to show you this last wee one now. And then um, imagine for a second. So this is a really fascinating study. Re I've just seen it repeated recently, relatively uh, recently. I need all of you to get ready to type an answer inside the chat for me. I want you to imagine for a second that a teen's likelihood of smoking is X, okay? Their, their, their likelihood of smoking is X. How much more likely in percentage terms do you think they are to smoke if they are considered troubled? Now, that is not my definition. That's the definition of the researchers. And that essentially means that they're maybe involved in some sort of intervention. So inside the chat, tell me, in percentage terms, what do we think? So Norman, Storm and Norman is saying 10. Pauline is saying 12. Letty Ann, Letty Ann's a cool name. I bet Letty Ann would make great jam. I feel like the name Letty Ann is someone who knows how to make outstanding preserves. Uh, so Matty is saying 17%. Of course, of, I mean, of course he is. Uh, so uh, Carrie is saying 10. Okay, Sarah is saying 30. Glenda is saying 40. Okay, loads of answers coming in. So a big spread there. This time in percentage terms, how much more likely are they to smoke if their parents smoke? Type this inside the chat for me and let me see what you think. So for the first one, Phoebe had put 70%. Phoebe, I love the reunion, by the way. You were fantastic in it. Uh, Angie Johnston is saying, Stella, Stella! Great boxer. Um, Robert is saying 30%. David is saying 20%. Donna is saying 40%. Abine is saying 50%. Okay, what about this one? What about if two of their friends smoke inside the chat? How much more likely do you think they are to smoke? Nary is saying 40%. Liv, Liv, is that Olivia? Or is Liv an actual name? It's a cool name. Uh, Yagesh is saying 80%. Sean is saying 70%. Okay, so the number's definitely getting a little higher. Storm and Norman's rising as well. 60%. Good man, Norman. What about if three or more of their friends smoke? What do we think? What is the likelihood that they will smoke in percentage terms? Is it, uh, so Emily is saying 85%. Camilla is saying, uh, oh, your number disappeared, Camilla. Gail is saying 80%. Okay, interesting. Well, let me tell you what the correct answer is. It's about to appear on screen. And the moment that it appears on screen, please, inside the chat, I want you to tell me exactly what you think, because they might surprise you. If uh, they are considered troubled, then they're 18% more likely to smoke. If their parents smoke, it's 31%. If two of their friends smoke, they are 1,006% more likely to smoke. If three or more of their friends smoke, they are 2,400%. The fact is we are the sum of the people that we spend. I realize a couple of you are, are, it's actually put you in the notion for a smoke and I can tell a couple of you are gasp and you're gonna nip out just for some, some fresh air. I apologize in many ways, I'm part of the problem, but um, it is absolutely incredible, isn't it? Because we are driven uh, by the people around us. So. I would encourage you to please take a couple of things away from this session. The first thing is do me a favor, make sure you say hello on social media. I'm on LinkedIn because I'm down with the kids. I'm on Instagram because I'm in my 30s and I want to feel relevant. And I'm on Twitter because I imagine that's still trying to be a platform. So uh, look me up on all of those places and say hello. But the, the real message that I want you to take away is that you control and drive your mindset. You're not in the passenger seat, you're in the driving seat. So don't leave whatever your next step is to chance. And don't worry about making a bad decision. It genuinely doesn't matter. It's easy to fix a decision that's not quite right. It is impossible to fix indecision. But for me, I genuinely believe at this moment in your life, in your career, and in your education, nothing matters more than the people who surround you. So I have absolutely loved having the opportunity to catch up with you today. I wish we had more time. There's an all a, a whole host of things that we could have covered, but it's been so nice uh, to not feel terribly socially distanced this afternoon. So thank you for putting your cameras on. Come and say hello on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. And uh, for now, as we wrap up, I'm going to hand over to Shauna to give you a final close. Hi, everyone. I'm Shauna from the Employability and Careers team. And it's over to me to thank David for hosting such an entertaining and engaging session that really does conclude our Future Skills Week. There were definitely a few takeaways there that I think are important to all of us. Um, the card trick did remind us all about the importance of seeing the big picture, um, the importance of the growth mindset to be open to new opportunities, and those three key ingredients of effort, determination, and focus to help all of us achieve great things. So this session concludes our Future Skills Week. 
Um, it's been an amazing week of activity. I hope all of you have been able to attend a number of sessions. Um, we hosted 57 events over five days. It's the first Future Skills Week that the university has ever hosted. Most of the sessions have been recorded and are available for playback on the Future Skills Week website and also on the Careers at Ulster YouTube channel. For any students and grads that are on the session today, um, after a nice long weekend, the Employability and Careers team are gonna be back and all through the summer we'll be offering follow up help and support with CVs, applications, placement and graduate job search. So please do take advantage of that. So once again, David, thank you and your team for hosting such a great event for us as part of Future Skills Week. And I hope all of you enjoy the nice long bank holiday weekend.